Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the IBM Kiskis Light Quantum Seminar Series in this 130th episode. When we are, we are so happy with peace in this episode, in this moment about quantum computing with with Patrick Coles, I wanted to emphasize myself is Anne Alberto and a Kiski community advocate. And I would like to speak more about Patrick. Patrick Coles is the chief scientist at Norbert Computing. He currently works on thermodynamic artificial intelligence, which is a physics-based hardware paradigm for accelerating probabilistic and genetic AR application. Prior to joining Norbert Computing, Patrick led the near-term quantum computing efforts at Los Alamos National Lab and that lab, he mapped out the limitation of noisy quantum computers, such as barium platinum, and investigate the potential of operational quantum algorithms and quantum neural networks. Patrick has a broad background, having done his PhD in solid state physics and Berkeley, and his postdoc in quantum physics, quantum information theory, and quantum cryptography. At Carnegie Mellon University, National University of Singapore, and University of Waterloo, respectively. The broad of Patrick's career has been the intersection of physics with quantum and information technology. Welcome, Patrick. Okay, thank you, Alberto, for that nice introduction. Um, I'm happy uh, to talk to you today about thermodynamic AI and the fluctuation frontier. As Alberto mentioned, I'm a um, chief scientist at Normal Computing, uh, which is a New York-based startup company working on probabilistic AI. Um, but uh, before I get into thermodynamics, um, I'd like to give you a brief background of my journey from quantum computing to thermodynamic computing. Um, after all, uh, people typically know me for my uh, quantum efforts, and I previously worked a lot in quantum information theory, quantum foundations, quantum crypto, and quantum computing. Um, so let's first talk about quantum computing, and after all, this is a quantum computing seminar. So uh, I spent um, five years working at LANL, leading their near-term quantum computing efforts uh, on basically everything related to the NISC era, noisy intermediate scale quantum computing, um, including variational quantum algorithms, quantum machine learning, and quantum error mitigation. Um, and uh, the, the idea of a parameterized quantum circuit was essentially synonymous with the NISC era, NISC era and that's really what we focused on during my time at LANL. Uh, this this uh, diagram on the right, shows the basic idea. You have an onsatz or a parameterized quantum circuit that you train by minimizing a cost function that, uh, that accounts for some task like solving a linear system of equations or factoring numbers or finding the ground state of a molecule. And just by minimizing that cost function, you can then accomplish your task in a, in a task-oriented manner. So this is a way to do automated programming of quantum computers. And it really captured people's interest over the past seven years as a promising approach to get quantum advantage in the NISC era. Um, but when I was at LANL, we were really interested in the fundamental limitations of this approach and uh, in questions like, could we actually achieve quantum advantage despite um, the noise of the NISC era? And we discovered a phenomenon called noise-induced barren plateaus. What is the barren plateau? It's a exponentially vanishing gradient. The idea is that the gradient shrinks exponentially with the number of qubits. And um, that's an issue because it can turn uh, polynomial scaling algorithms into exponentially scaling ones. And the idea is that if your gradients are exponentially small, you have to expend exponential resources or shots to characterize those gradients. Um, and for noise-induced barren plateaus, uh, we basically considered any, any onsatz that, uh, whose depth scales polynomially in the number of qubits. That includes chemistry-based onsatzes like unitary coupled cluster onsatz as well as um, you know combinatorial optimization onsatz is like Quawa. And we found that indeed the um, for those kind of onsatz, uh, the gradients uh, shrink exponentially in the number of qubits. And the implications of this are that you really have to pay super close attention to noise whenever you're studying quantum advantage. Um, this plot here on the right shows the case where we're solving a max cut problem using QAOA. And you can see from the black curve, which is the noise-free case, that it looks like we're getting quantum advantage as you increase the circuit depth P, uh, where the idea is that the blue dashed lines correspond 
to the classical case. So the blue, the top blue dashed line is the NP hard limit, and then the bottom blue dashed line is the classical Gomans Williamson algorithm. And uh, so naively, you might be thinking you're going to get quantum advantage with this uh, Quawa circuit. But then once you account for noise, you get uh, the green or the red curve. The green is the case where you have noise-free cost evaluation, and the red is the case where everything is noisy. Um, and you can see for these curves, they actually dip below the blue dashed lines, which means you actually lose your quantum advantage as you increase your circuit depth. So, so this was you know, a very important observation because it meant that um, noise was crucial for understanding quantum advantage here. And naturally, when we were at LANL, when I was at LANL, uh, we were interested in um, trying to solve this problem. And so we looked at potential solutions like, could you apply error mitigation methods? For example, zero noise extrapolation, which was, you know, developed here at, at IBM, as well as other error mitigation methods like Clifford data regression. And um, unfortunately, we found that the answer was no, error mitigation did not solve this issue. We still got exponential scaling uh, despite error mitigation. And the explanation for that was that um, even though error mitigation methods bump up your gradient sizes, they also bump up your shot noise. Uh, and it's the ratio between your gradient size and your shot noise that really matters for trainability. Um, and so the, the next obvious question is, well, if error mitigation doesn't work, what about error correction? And uh, we did, we have some evidence suggesting, yes, that could actually work. Uh, namely, we considered a simple toy model where each error corrected qubit uh, is viewed as just a perfectly clean qubit. Um, and we found that with every clean qubit that we added to the system, uh, the gradients would increase exponentially. And so uh, um, what this suggests is that certain variational quantum algorithms, um, which everyone, of course, was hoping for the NISC era, uh, might be better thought of as error-corrected uh, algorithms. And so in some sense, some algorithms get pushed out in time scale there. Uh, so this was a uh, you know an important observation in, in my head, um, and uh, definitely sort of changed my perspective a little bit. Uh, I, but you know, nevertheless, there's of course other algorithms that are not variational, and I did want to um, congratulate the IBM team uh, on their exciting breakthrough, um, showing evidence for the utility of quantum computing for uh, before fault tolerance. And so, in that sense, I still think the NISC era is very interesting, and there's other uh, promising approaches for the NISC era and um, yeah, still really interesting stuff going on there. Um, so, uh, but nevertheless, my my journey uh, my journeys into quantum got me thinking a lot about noise, and um, made me think, you know, why is it that noise always seems to present a roadblock to computing? Um, and you know, this is not just a quantum issue. Even classical analog computing struggled with noise in the 20th century. Um, in the late, sorry, in the uh, basically 1950s to 1970s, analog computers were essentially replaced by digital ones because, after all, digital computers were reliable, they were more precise, less noisy. Um, and so this really led to the downfall of classical analog computing in the 20th century. Uh, nevertheless, you know, analog computing was pretty cool. Um, there was a lot of kind of bespoke analog computers uh, developed. This 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 uh, picture just shows an analog computer from 1960, um, and they were used uh, typically uh, to solve things like differential equations. Here, this circuit on the bottom right shows uh, a circuit that can be used to uh, simulate a, a, a mass on a spring under the force of gravity. Um, so, but you know, in any case, um, it seems like a repeating pattern that noise is a major issue for computing paradigms. And, and that got me thinking about um, whether there was computing paradigms out there where noise is not an issue, or even better, could noise actually be beneficial to certain computing paradigms? Um, and you know, of course, over the past year, um, artificial intelligence, AI, has captured the world's imagination. There's been uh, text to image, text to video, text to text, a lot of really exciting developments in AI. Um, and if you actually look at the algorithms that people use in AI, the modern algorithms, um, many of them actually exploit noise to generate novel samples. So here I'm showing the case where you're generating an image of a cat. And if you want to generate a new image of a cat, 
uh, noise can actually be, be useful there. And so I started thinking about AI more. Um, if you dive more into, uh, say, generative AI, um, you can come across an algorithm called a diffusion model. And, um, and in the case of diffusion models, you have a forward diffusion process where, say, you take an image of a leaf and then you gradually add noise to it. Um, and then uh, you then train a neural network to kind of understand that noising process. And, and then that allows that neural network to facilitate the reversal of that process, which is called the reverse process, which can allow you to start from noise and then generate a new image of a leaf. Um, but, you know, the underlying uh, theme here throughout uh, the diffusion model process is that noise is playing a key role, both in the forward process and the reverse process. There's stochastic dynamics that you can describe by a stochastic differential equation that's actually uh, facilit facilitating this process and helping you to generate a novel sample. Um, so you don't just want to repeat the, the, the training data, you actually want to generate something new. Um, and so that's diffusion models give a nice example where stochastic noise is, is useful. And, you know, this point is actually not lost on the experts in the field. So the, some of the leading AI uh, experts have also pointed out the fact that, um, you know, stochasticity is useful and current hardware has its limitations. So Jeffrey Hinton uh, has pointed this out and he's called for um, a shift in how we do hardware from what he calls uh, immortal computation to mortal computation. Um, the case where software and hardware are um, completely separate to then the case where software and hardware are inseparable. And he points out, uh, he pointed out in his 2022 NeurIPS talk that there's all sorts of variable, stochastic, flaky, analog, unreliable properties that could actually be useful in the hardware. Um, and you know, this has been echoed by other people as well. Um, there's this piece by Sarah Hooker where she mentioned that um, machine learning is effectively stuck in a local optimum right now with our current hardware. Uh, we have you know, GPUs, which are great, but they can be viewed as kind of constraining what we could potentially do with AI and machine learning. And if we could just move away from these, these GPUs, these, this, this digital hardware, we could really get out of our local optimum and get to a global optimum um, and explore algorithm and hardware co-design. Um, and uh, because ultimately the hardware constrains algorithmically which, which you can actually do. So it constrains the kind of algorithms that you're gonna actually explore. And this was also echoed by uh, Jan LeCun who pointed out that um, some of the most important applications like probabilistic modeling are actually intractable in the continuous domain on um, current digital uh, GPU hardware. So really many people are echoing the need for new hardware and AI and also pointing out some key concepts for what that hardware might, might look like, like stochasticity. So, um, you know, this motivates us to just basically start um, start start from you know the ground up start uh, go back to the drawing board and ask you know if we were to build computers uh, from scratch how would we actually make them um, and uh, you know to realize this this vision that these AI leaders have really uh, pointed out um, you know let's revisit the fundamental building blocks of computers uh, of course everyone is familiar with uh, classical bits and this audience you know is also going to be familiar with qubits of course um, P bits are kind of in between, these are probabilistic bits uh, and in between bits and qubits in some sense. Um, and, uh, but the key common theme between these um, paradigms is typically, or oftentimes they're inherently static. Um, they're designed to stay still unless you intentionally act upon them by a gate, of course. Um, in practice, sometimes they drift, but, in but the ideal case, they're designed to stay still. But what if we relax that assumption um, and considered a fundamental building block that's inherently dynamic in time? Uh, and you know, in, so this involves, of course, introducing a time axis. So to actually describe the basic building block, you have to basically show like a plot in, in time. So you have to introduce an, an additional axis to describe the building block. And then you could come up with something like a stochastic bit, which is jumping back and forth between uh, two states at random times. Um, and, you know, 
why would we want to do something like this? Well, because as I mentioned, stochasticity is a resource. Uh, it shows up in many different contexts, like dropout of neurons to prevent overfitting and machine learning, um, SGD and simulated annealing and optimization problems to escape local minima. And of course, as I mentioned already, um, sampling and generative AI want novel samples. And so stochasticity is actually useful there. So um, while it might be tempting to just go with the stochastic bit, um, there, uh, you know, what we are arguing for is actually considering a continuous variable version of this. And the reason is that in the context of AI and machine learning, applications are often continuous in nature. Um, after all, the weights of a neural network are typically continuous. Um, the features of data, like stock prices, for example, are also continuous. Um, and then finally, probability density functions, which are crucial for Bayesian inference, like, for example, Gaussian distributions, these are also continuous as well. Um, so just to match the hardware to the application, it would be natural to consider a continuous system. Um, and so we're proposing um, stochastic units, or S units, which um, basically undergo a Brownian motion, also known as a, known as a Wiener process, uh, and, in time. And this uh, illustrates the basic idea. And you can, you can see how this might be useful because instead of just erasing the previous state of your bit, as in the case of S-bits, you have just a gradual loss of information over time rather than full erasure. And this seems natural for generating novelty while still actually maintaining information about the past. So, uh, so then to just summarize, then um, we have building blocks of different computing paradigms. Um, of course, bits and modes in the classical case, and in the quantum case, we have qubits and q modes. Um, and then we're what we're calling thermodynamic computing involves stochastic bits, or uh, in the discrete case, and then stochastic modes, which I sometimes call stochastic units in the continuous case. So, One is there a question? Is there a question, one question Patrick. I had one question. Yeah. Well, we know how can create a classical B, quantum B, probabilistic B, but what do you need or what kind of devices you need to design a stochastic bit? Is that's a that... great yeah, that's a great question. And uh it's it's actually literally my my next slide. Yeah, but but yeah, that's oh, a nice. great question. Um cool. All right, I'll get to it in my next slide. Yes, and please. yeah. OK, so how do we actually realize these stochastic units? I am going to focus more on the continuous case rather than the discrete case. Um, there's uh, other ideas out there for how to realize um, uh, bits that undergo stochastic processes, like mag magnetic tunnel junctions, for example. Uh, but I'm not going to focus on the uh, discrete case. Um, I'm going to focus more on the continuous case. And um, in this case, we have. Uh, uh, one way to realize this with a simple circuit is just an RC circuit um, in series. So, so a resistor and a capacitor in series, assuming your resistor is at some finite temperature, then um, this hot resistor can actually be modeled as an ideal resistor in series with a stochastic voltage source, this delta V here. Um, and then the thermal noise that that resistor produces scales with the square root of the temperature. Um, you, there's other kinds of noise sources that you could have, like... Uh, shot noise, for example, is another kind of noise source. Um, and you could also have digital noise as well. There's a variety of different types of noise sources that you could use here. Um, but uh, then the idea is that if you were to solve for the dynamics of this system, namely the voltage at point one, um, it follows this differential equation down here, uh, which has both a drift term as well as a stochastic or Brownian motion term. And that's the, that's the kind of... Um, the dynamics that you want when you want to consider things like diffusion models. You want a drift term and a diffusion or stochastic term here. Um, but of course, we don't just want a, a single stochastic unit. We actually want multiple stochastic units, um, analogous to how you don't just want a single qubit for a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to have multiple stochastic units, um, you can imagine coupling them electrically uh, they could be coupled either with a resistive bridge here or with a capacitive bridge down at the bottom. Um, or there could be the potential other kinds of couplings, like inductive coupling or a variety of different types of couplings. Um, but in any case, uh, if you have um, resistive coupling, you end up with a particular differential equation. Now things are vector quantities, so V is a vector. And then these are now matrices, C and J and R. Um, 
and those matrices depend on the nature of the coupling. Um, similarly, you have some other differential equation for the case of capacitive coupling. And uh, you can, of course, choose your coupling um, to fit the nature of your application or what you actually want to want to uh, what kind of algorithms you want to run. And um, and then through by coupling all these different stochastic units, you can eventually build up what we call the SPU. SPU stands for stochastic processing unit, analogous to like CPU or GPU. And um, and then um, your SPU will be composed of these coupled stochastic units and uh, you can have switches that allow you to control, you know, which ones are actually coupled. That could be useful to tailor the connectivity to the problem geometry. You might be, for example, looking at, um, you know, a 1D geometry from DNA sequences or a 2D geometry from images. And so in that sense, you can use switches to control the, the connectivity here. Um, but yeah, that's the basic idea of the stochastic processing unit. And um, in terms of applications for this hardware, uh, you know, I already mentioned diffusion models, uh, but there's a bunch of other applications like Bayesian neural networks, Monte Carlo inference, annealing, like simulated annealing, as well as time series forecasting. Um, and at first sight, you might think that these are actually different applications and would actually require different hardware for each, uh, uh, for each application. But um, the exciting thing is that it, we, we were able to basically unify these applications under one umbrella, and we call them thermodynamic AI algorithms um, in the sense that they're all described by the same math, and we can use one hardware to actually run all these different applications um, yeah, on the hardware. So, we, uh, just... we, have, so excuse me. we had another question. Absolutely. Is how is the information encoding in SBIT as a frequency like a, in a spiking neural network? Or what is the difference? How is information encoded? Yeah. So um, the information, uh, so, so the information could be encoded in the voltages across the capacitors, like the voltage at point one um, and the voltage at point two. And so then you would read off the state of the system by just reading off the voltages at particular points in the circuit. Um, yeah. So, and similarly, if you want to initialize the system, you could potentially, you know, charge capacitors in a certain way. Um, but yeah, but the idea is that when you read off the information, you're reading off voltages. Is that answering the question? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and right, so I mentioned these, this class of algorithms that I'm calling thermodynamic AI algorithms. Um, and the cool thing is that they all seem to follow um, a set of coupled differential equations that I'm showing here on the slide. The first equation is a stochastic differential equation. The second one is an ordinary differential equation. And the last one is a partial differential equation. And for those of you in the audience who are physicists or who have a, phys a physics background, you'll probably recognize that these equations look like Newton's laws of motion. It's basically Newton's laws um, with a diffusion term, this DW term, as well as a friction term here. Um, and then P corresponds to momentum, X is position, and then F is force and U is potential energy. Uh, this provides the broad general framework for uh, thermodynamic AI algorithms. But if you want to specialize to a particular problem, um, then you're basically going to be choosing U of theta in a certain way. In other words, all the problem specific information up to hyperparameters basically goes into U. Uh, for example, the loss function that you want to optimize in simulated annealing um, corresponds to U. In the case of Monte Carlo sampling, U is the log of the distribution that you want to sample from. And in the case of diffusion models, U is the log of the noisy dis noise, noise distribution. Um, so, so yeah, that's where the problem-specific information comes in. But the exciting thing is that all, if you have a hardware that can run these three equations, then you can then simulate all, all the relevant algorithms of interest. Uh, and there's at least uh, it, there's another way to look at this if you want to look at it more conceptually rather than mathematically, um, basically thermo AI algorithms are ones where you have to solve an SDE and also where you have a intelligent observer that observes the, a state variable in the SDE and then applies a drift function in response. Uh, that intelligent observer, as it turns out, has connection to something called a Maxwell's demon, and I'm going to get into that next. So 
so this there's a there's a thermodynamic concept that was introduced by James Clerk Maxwell uh, called well, now it's called Maxwell's demon, of course, but um, and he Maxwell thought of a thought experiment involving a gaseous mixture of of two different uh, particles, one say red and one blue. And he imagined that there was a barrier between the left and the right sides, and an intelligent observer could actually um, open the barrier or close the barrier uh, based on what they see. So for example, the intelligent observer could open the barrier whenever a red particle is approaching and close the barrier whenever a blue particle is approaching. And then over time, what will happen is that the red and the blue will start to separate, and eventually they'll be fully separated. And the result is that you will have gone from a high entropy situation situation to a low entropy situation. At first sight, this looks like it might violate the second law of thermodynamics, which says that entropy should always increase, but it turns out that it does not, and that the explanation is that the entropy uh, must increase somewhere else in the universe. So it's increasing somewhere else, um, such as in the observer themselves. And uh, yeah, but we can think of an electrical analog of that which involves basically, um, say, like a CPU monitoring the state of each individual S unit, which would basically be reading off the voltages on all the capacitors. And then in response, applying some voltage back to the system. This is what you would call a voltage controlled voltage source. Um, and in this way, assuming that the observer applies the right kind of voltages back to the system, then we could go from a high entropy situation down to a low entropy situation. Um, yeah, so that's the electrical analog of this of this Maxwell's demon. And um, now, what about, of course, in the context of actual AI algorithms that you might be interested in, like Monte Carlo sampling or generative AI? In that case, um, what 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 is analogous to a high entropy situation? Well, um, Gaussian distributions satisfy a maximum entropy principle, um, so you can view Gaussian distributions as kind of high entropy. Um, and it turns out that um, the stochastic units by themselves uh, uh, cannot really produce complicated probability distributions. They typically produce Gaussians if you left them owned, if you just let them do their own thing. Um, and so, if you really want to produce something complicated, like a low entropy distribution where you have uh, multiple modes um, and you know complicated situation here, like show, I show on the bottom, then you actually need uh, external guidance. Um, and this is where the Maxwell demon can come into play. So moving beyond Gaussians is, is where the Maxwell demon plays, plays a big role. How would you actually realize this Maxwell's demon in practice? Uh, well, you could just store it on a CPU. You could just have basically a digital neural network that's stored on a CPU and it gets trained over time. Uh, and then you just basically have communication back and forth between the analog system and the digital system uh, via ADCs and DACs. Um, and that's a very easy way to go, and um, it has some positives because it's flexible and it, uh, in the sense that um, you can change the architecture for the neural network on the CPU. It also can have high expressibility. You can have a lot of parameters in that neural network. The downsides, of course, are that you have to deal with signal interconversion uh, back and forth between analog and digital, and then there's also latency of communication uh, that you have to deal with between the two devices. Um, and so, you know, not to to resolve some of those issues, you could consider alternatively an analog Maxwell's demon, um, which would uh, help de deal with the latency issue, as well as the signal interconversion issue. Um, the downside, of course, is that it's less flexible because the architecture might be more fixed. Um, and uh, but there's various ways that you could make this analog Maxwell's demon. Uh, here, I show the case where you're basically solving a ODE. Um, there's another approach where you could have a, a force-based approach where you introduce a auxiliary variable, which is like a momentum variable, and then you have phase-based dynamics between X and P, and then you compute the gradient of some potential and then apply a force back to the system. So there's a variety of ways of doing this, um, but nevertheless, I just want to point out that the stochastic units by themselves are not enough. You also need this this Maxwell's demon to help guide the stochastic units. And so with that, that basically summarizes um, the hardware, the thermodynamic hardware. Um, and so I just want to basically have some remarks at the midpoint of the talk. Um, you know, make lemonade from lemons. Whenever noise blocks your computer, you know, you can switch paradigms to thermodynamic hardware to uh, where noise is a resource. 
Um, but there is nevertheless you know, an all, olive branch of the quantum community and that many of the ideas that I discussed already um, can actually be applied in the quantum setting. So there's some interesting research directions there to extend these to the quantum case. Um, and as I mentioned, probabilistic AI and generative AI appear to be killer apps for thermodynamic hardware. I also pointed out a connection between AI algorithms and physics. Um, I also have a blog on that. And uh, But finally, the most perhaps the question that might be on many of your minds, um, given that much of the audience might be from the quantum community, is what sort of speed ups might we, might, might we actually uh, get in practice? So, um, so I'm going to dive into speed ups next, but I think I'll just pause for a second to see if there's any questions right now. Yeah, actually, we have a question is, well, you show us what is the this new way to create the, the mm -hmm. stochastic bit. So how will the neural network be training? It could be the target, the cost function. How can we involve in all of this, uh, we know in classical computing, in this stochastic uh, unit? So is the same way, or how can we can uh, mm. Or what is the process to convert? Yeah. The body? There's, a, there's actually an interesting um, analogy between variational quantum algorithms, which I talked about at the beginning of my talk, and then trying to train, say, this Maxwell's demon. If you have your Maxwell's demon on a CPU, it's like a hybrid digital analog training process, similar to how in variational quantum algorithms we have a hybrid quantum classical uh, process. Um, but in this case, uh, the Maxwell's demon would be the classical thing, it would be the uh, digital thing, and um, the stochastic units would be the analog. And, and then you would potentially have your, um, the whole, you would use the whole system to help you to evaluate the cost function, which, um, uh, for example, in the context of generative AI is often like uh, score matching. So you would try to match the score. Uh, so the score is the, gra the grad log prob. Um, and so there's a variety of different cost functions that people use um, another one is the elbow bound, evidence-based lower bound. And uh, com these are commonly used cost functions in machine learning. Um, but you know, I didn't, I, I didn't get into details about how you actually minimize this cost function, but nevertheless, you can have a kind of uh, hybrid loop involving digital and uh, analog systems. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. We had more couple of questions, one from Kevin. Are these prospective new utility or performance advantage with thermodynamics hardware? Performance advantage. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's going to be the subject of the latter half of the talk. So can I maybe just uh, save that question for the rest? Because that's the, the rest of the talk will be about performance advantage. Oh, nice. And okay. we had other two questions. One is for Deepak. What happens to concepts like a uh, Turing tape or the Hayden problem in the thermodynamic AI framework. Okay, sounds like you're talking about things like universality, um, because in the digital setting, you have um, things like uh, proofs of universality and, and other things. And that's a great question and still under investigation, but um, there's definitely some interesting questions about um, to what degree can you make a, a universal thermodynamic hardware um, and at the moment, um, I'm not going to give an answer to that, but I'll just say that, um, you know, it's under investigation. And I think that there are some, some really cool questions about how you can make uh, things, things universal on the thermodynamic side. Yeah. And um, the last question is, can this be used for a random walk algorithms? Random walk algorithms. Yeah, um, that's a good question. And yeah, there could be some, there, there's a lot of different directions that you could go with with this thermodynamic hardware. Um, and that definitely would be a, a good one to explore. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna say, yeah, that's a good idea, basically. <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. For... Okay, okay, I'm gonna move on then to the rest of the talk. Thanks for the questions. Um, so what kind of speed ups will we actually get in practice? Well. Um, this is going to be application specific. Some applications will have bigger speedups than others, but let me just start with the simplest primitive, which is Gaussian sampling. Um, this shows up in a variety of different contexts like derivative pricing, uncertainty quantification for neural nets and time series forecasting like sales forecasting. 
And what you can see here from this plot, which is a numeric space benchmark, this is comparison to state-of-the-art GPUs. So once again, SPU stands for Stochastic Processing Unit, is that um, as we, you know, even for this very simple uh, primitive, we are actually seeing significant speed up even as we increase the, uh, the dimension. Um, the, the speed up is actually limited, interestingly, not by the physical dynamics, but actually by the digital overhead that we incur uh, whenever we want to interface um, with digital hardware, like digital compilation or data loading and readout. Uh, so there's potential possibilities for speeding up these, these issues there. Um, but I wanted to emphasize that Gaussian sampling has stiff competition on the digital side. Basically, GPUs are ideally suited for Gaussian sampling. But even for this application that's ideally suited for GPUs, we can still potentially uh, offer some speed up here, which is pretty exciting. Um, and and in, in addition, there's also some expected energy savings as well. After all, GPUs consume a huge amount of energy. And so we expect to get um, uh, potentially multiple orders of magnitude of, of energy savings relative to GPUs as well. This is for the context of Gaussian sampling. But if we want to really unlock larger speedups, then uh, uh, I want to talk about uh, non-Gaussian sampling. So uh, because then this starts to remove some of the competition on the, on the digital side, non-Gaussian sampling is relevant to uh, Bayesian neural networks, for example, where you, you're doing principled uncertainty quantification for neural nets. And um, this, is a, this is an application that's actually harder for uh, digital hardware. And, and because of that, we actually see uh, larger speedups. So here, once again, we're doing numerical benchmarks of the speedups as we increase the problem size. And now we're starting to see two or three orders of magnitude of speedup relative to GPUs, which is pretty exciting. And so the gen there's a general theme in which um, it looks like the more sophisticated uh, um, the algorithm or method that we're, we're doing, um, the more speed up we can potentially unlock. Here, I'm looking at the special case of where the application is uncertainty quantification for neural networks. And the more uncertainty awareness, awareness we add, um, the more speed up uh, or energy savings we could potentially unlock there. Um, so at least that's sort of the, the trend that we're, we're seeing right now. Um, but um, okay, so so thus far I've showed you um, I've showed you numerical speedups, right? But the quantum community, uh, you know, given that this audience is a quantum audience, the quantum community is used to big O notation and you know rigorously provable speedups, uh, and so you might be sort of thirsting for some big O notation there in the audience, um, and so. Uh, yeah, to dive into this issue of could, could we find analytical speedups for thermodynamic hardware, uh, we have an archive paper that uh, was just posted this week uh, called Thermodynamic Linear Algebra. And this is about looking at linear algebra applications of thermo thermodynamic hardware. Now, why should we look at, thermo at uh, linear algebra? Well, obviously, linear algebra has uh, tons of applications. But on top of that, um, asymptotic scalings are really well characterized for linear algebra problems. So they serve as really good testing grounds for speedups, right? So here's the table, for example, that I can show you here for digital state-of-the-art algorithms for various primitives like solving linear systems, uh, inverting matrices, finding the determinant of a matrix. And um, so, so linear algebra provides a really nice testing ground for, for speedups for these, uh, since the speedups are so characterized here. Um, and what we did in this paper is that we um, considered a system of coupled harmonic oscillators. And we imagine that you were able to set up a potential energy function V of X that looks like this. This is a quadratic form. Um, uh, basically, A enters into the quadratic term and B enters into the linear term. And if you're able to set up this potential energy function and you allow the system to come to thermal equilibrium, then you can show that the dynamical variable X is Gaussian distributed with a mean whose inverse, who's with a mean that is a inverse b, and then with a, a covariance matrix that's proportional to a inverse. So, what are the implications of that? Well, it means that if you just allow the system to come to thermal equilibrium, and then you characterize the first moment, you can get a, the solution of a linear system of equations, a inverse b. And similarly, if you characterize the second moment, you can get a matrix inverse. And so you can take this basic observation and turn it into a thermodynamic algorithm for solving linear systems of equations and matrix and inverting matrices. 
Um, so, so this diagram at the bottom shows what that algorithm looks like. You have a linear system of the form AX equals B. You then upload A and B to your harmonic oscillator system to establish the potential above. You wait for the system to come to equilibrium. Then you start sampling, you extract the trajectory, and then you compute the first moment. You can do that with a time integral, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, and then with the, as I said, the first moment gives you A inverse B, the second moment gives you A inverse, and that's our uh, very simple thermodynamic algorithm for these primitives. Um, now, I mentioned that you can do a time integral, um, and that comes from a thermodynamic property called ergodicity. Um, ergodicity says that at, at thermal equilibrium, the dynamics of a single trajectory reflect that of the entire ensemble. And you can see that from this plot here. Um, on the left side, we're showing the time dynamics of a single trajectory, and you can see that it's basically covering the right distribution, whereas on the right side, we're actually showing the distribution's dynamics. So you can see that the two plots match at at thermal equilibrium. Um, so that allows you to um, basically replace an ensemble average with a time average. So you can just have a single trajectory that you take the time average of here to get your solution to your problem. Um, so now let's go back to the question that I posed, which is, could we obtain analytical speed ups for thermodynamic hardware? Um, and um, the good news that we're excited to share with you is that the answer is yes. Speed up um, we're predicting a speed up that's actually scaling linearly in the dimension D, so uh, the matrix dimension D. And the idea is that our algorithms are predicted to scale uh, linearly in the dimension, uh, whereas the digital ones go as something like D squared. Um, and to our knowledge, this is the first rigorously established speed up for uh, thermodynamic computing. So we're very excited about this. So. Um, and I will mention that our algorithm's uh, complexity depends on whether the dynamics are of the harmonic oscillators are overdamped or underdamped. So you actually get different complexities depending on uh, which regime it's in. We can run numerics to try to corroborate the analytics. And uh, sure enough, when we do the numerics, we are seeing that, our, that the runtime of our algorithms scales linearly with D uh, so that, that um, you know, indeed, uh, sort of corroborates the finding that if our, if the runtime is going linear with D, then we're getting uh, basically speed up that scales linear relative to the digital case. Um, now, uh, what what really you might be interested in is, um, I mean, not just big O notation, but for these applications like solving linear systems, could you get a speed up in practice? So, um, and to answer that, we, we developed a detailed timing model of the hardware that accounts for not just the analog dynamics, but also the digital overhead associated with compilation and other things like that. And um, so with this detailed timing model, we, we ran numerics for various dimensions and various condition numbers kappa. So kappa is the condition number of the matrix. And uh, we compared this to digital state-of-the-art methods like the conjugate gradient method, which is an iterative method for solving linear systems, and the uh, Cholesky method, which is which is just a one-time thing. And um, we get what we get for our analog uh, method is we or our thermodynamic method are these um, curves here in the blue and green, and we can see that um, for small condition numbers. Um, you know, it's it's sort of hard to beat the digital methods, but then as we increase the condition number, this is for dimension 1000, as we increase the condition number, uh, we start to really see a larger and larger uh, speed ups relative to the digital methods. Um, so our speed up is being observed to increase with condition number. Um, and also, as I mentioned previously, it, it increases with dimension as well. And so you have these um, the ability to crank up the speed up as you increase kappa and D. Um, the other thing that you might see from these plots is that it looks like the thermodynamic algorithms are um, like quickly qu quickly decrease, but then kind of level off. And so that looks like they're useful for fast, low precision solutions relative to digital hardware. Um, however, I will mention that you have the ability to increase the precision of, of the solutions that we get from the hardware by lowering the temperature. Um, and so... Uh, that is, you can see that the blue curve is below the green curve here. So um, there are ways to effectively lower the temperature and hence get higher precision from the hardware. I had yeah. one question. Yes, please. Uh, is, okay, you can do uh, increase the speed of, but what happened with the noise? 
or how can you quantify or how to deal it with the noise? What happened in that situation? Is a benefit or is more, a, yeah, what is the- That's a good the, question. Um, in the context of linear systems, the noise is actually not as useful. Um, in <laughs> contrast for matrix inversion and some of our other methods um, where you actually have to you know, quantify the second moment, noise is actually useful. So noise, noise is useful for matrix inversion, but because linear systems just depends on the first moment, then noise um, does not enter in as, as, as something that's useful. Um, so then that's why, of course, temperature, uh, it helps to lower the temperature here. Okay, I'm following with that. Victor has another question. How do you quantify the noise as a resource? Is there a metric? Mm. Quantify the noise as a resource. Um, so uh, not at, I, I would say not at the moment. I guess that's kind of an interesting question. I think that um, the, as I said, in some cases, the noise is a resource for the matrix inversion. So I guess it would be relevant to that case. Um, and uh, yeah, because, but, you know, I, I don't have a great answer for that at the moment. Um, and I'll just say it's sort of under investigation. Yeah. Mm, okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Great. All right. I'll keep going. Um, so uh, we get similar results for other linear algebra primitives. Um, so we can consider um, matrix inversion. And here we also have some numerics compared to uh, the digital state of the art method. So the digital state of the art method is a vertical line here. And we can see as we increase the dimension, um, we're getting more and more speed up. That is, the digital is going farther to the right. And, uh, and, and hence, um, matrix inversion speed up is, is, is observed to increase uh, with, with the dimension. Um, and you know, we have similar results also for some other primitives like matrix determinants as well. Um, so we think this is really exciting. Um, and you know, naturally, it begs some interesting questions like, uh, what other mathematical primitives could we accelerate with thermodynamic hardware? Uh, we talked about linear algebra. You can imagine nonlinear algebra problems. Or, you know, I think the creative juices can really get flowing about what other kind of primitives uh, we could solve with thermodynamic hardware. Um, any other questions on the linear algebra stuff? For the moment, no. OK. All right, great. So um, with that, I'd like to present uh, one more thing and sort of a Steve Jobs thing and say that, um, uh, you know, with these you know, breakthroughs that we've shown, we're trying to uh, democratize interactive tools for you know, engaging, engaging with them. Um, and so uh, we've developed something that we call a, a, thermodynamic, a thermodynamic playground or thermo playground that gives you the experience of interacting with this new category of hardware electronics. Um, also, um, the implicit message there is that um, thermodynamic hardware is coming soon. Uh, in February when we posted this theory paper, and now uh, we're talking about in the near future, actual real hardware, which is shown on the right, uh, coming very soon. And we want to give people the feel of what would, it, what would it be like to interact with this new hardware? So um, the Thermo Playground, um, it, so this gives you sort of a, a sense of what the Thermo Playground looks like. Um, we illustrate this for the special case of sampling from a Gaussian. So we already talked about sampling from a Gaussian in the context of speed ups. This is what it would look like to sample from a Gaussian, say with our hardware. Um, we show the special case here of sampling in two dimensions. Um, and you can, the user is allowed to choose the covariance matrix. So you can play with, you can upload different covariance matrices to choose different distributions to sample from. And the samples are gathered in real time and, and shown in this 2D plot and also shown in 1D here. Uh, and we give you the freedom to also adjust some of the hardware knobs like the temperature, uh, the resistance, and the inductance in the circuit um, in, and the sampling rate in order to see how that impacts the performance of the sampling algorithm. So, OK, so that's the uh, visual interface that we're providing to people. Um, and uh, we also uh, get into an application for this, uh, namely reliable AI. So I've talked a little bit about um, AI and how um, it often tends to be overconfident. So if you have here, we show a simple classification problem. It's a binary classification problem where you have 
It's called the two moon data set. And if you just use a standard neural net to classify this, um, the result is what you get here where, um, and, and it's, it tends to be overconfident. So the, on, the, on the right hand side, it shows that um, it has basically 100% confidence for things that are even far away from the training data. So this red point is far away from the training data, and yet it still predicts with 100% certainty that it belongs to the orange group. Um, there are methods to, to deal with this, like uh, something called SNGPs, spectral normalized neural Gaussian processes, and uh, they provide uncertainty quantification through distance awareness. Uh, basically, you can quantify how far you are away from the training data, and the farther you are away, the more uncertainty you have. And whenever you use this approach, it gives you the right expected results, which is that for the red dot, it's uncertain about which class it belongs to. Um, and we've incorporated this, the reason I'm showing you this, of course, is that we've incorporated this into our Thermo playground. So uh, we allow you to explore uncertainty quantification in AI or in neural nets um, and basically see how changing the knobs of the hardware would ultimately um, affect the performance of this uncertainty quantification uh, application. And uh, with that, I'd actually like to um, go to a live demo. So I'm going to end the slideshow for the moment, and then I'm going to go over to the um, this. I assume you can see my screen. Is that right? Uh, yes. OK, great. Thank you. So um, yeah, this is a website um, that we're making available to the public uh, um, later today. And uh, this is um, the interface for our Thermo Playground. And so there's three tabs. There's an about, about page, which is a landing page. Then if we click on the uh, Thermo Playground, then um, we can see, see here's the interface where you can change the covariance matrix for the distribution that you'd like to sample from. So I can uh, change the variance and change the correlation between the variables. And you can see that over time, the samples are gradually approaching the right distribution, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's some initial time that you have to wait, but eventually the samples approach the right distribution. Um, I, can, I can change it in the other way, but yeah. And, and then similarly, you can uh, change the parameters of the hardware. Um, so why would you want to change the parameters of the hardware? Well, certain parameters don't give great performance. Um, if I turn the temperature down um, and, and also the sampling time is low, you can see that the samples are very correlated. Um, and correlated samples are generally bad because um, you, you, know, you want to have independent samples um, from your distribution. So, so if you want to get rid of the correlation between your samples, which is what you're seeing right now, you have a, a number of different ways to do it. You can increase the sampling time, uh, and that will um, then mean that you're discarding a bunch of samples, essentially. Um, so that will help. That's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is to increase the temperature. Um, if you increase the temperature, then that's basically adding more stochastic noise to the system. Um, so that also helps to get rid of correlations between samples. And then you can also play with the other knobs, like the resistance, which also affects the correlation time. Higher resistance leads to higher correlation. And the red window here, by the way, is just there to show you how correlated things are. So we definitely encourage you to, uh, to play around with this um, and, and, and enjoy it. Uh, and finally, the last thing is I mentioned uncertainty quantification and AI, this example of uh, the two moon data set. And here I show the ideal performance. Um, if uh, you know, if you had say digital hardware, um, and then we can see how um, our hardware performs in this case uh, by um, simulating here. We have two different knobs, of course, temperature and um, number of samples that we can change, and um, then we can see that um, when the when the temperature is very low, the performance actually doesn't match the ideal case, um, and so and that's largely because, as I mentioned, the samples are correlated to each other. So if we want to get uncorrelated samples, we can turn up the temperature uh, to make it much higher. And then let's see what happens. So now the samples should be less correlated. And indeed, we're starting to get closer um, to what the ideal case is. So, so and you can play with that as well. Um, and uh, we'll have more uh, details about that coming soon. So 
Let me just go back to the slides. Okay. Yeah, we had some more couple of questions. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, please, please go ahead. One is from Antonio is, one way to think about the nose is that it helps the system equilibrate. What, what is the computational step? What, what is the what? What is the computational step? The computational step? Yes. Okay, so the, the noise helps the system equilibrate. Ah, you're saying what part is the actual computation? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, analog, analog devices are interesting, right? Because they're not gate-based models, so it's not like you're counting gates or something. Uh, and so, um, you know, it's almost, for the quantum audience, a little bit more like quantum annealing in a sense. Um, and so it's it's harder to identify actual computations in the system because in some sense, physics is actually doing computations for you. Um, so like I mentioned that in the linear system case, we have to compute a time integral. Um, and of course, if you were to do that digitally, you'd be summing up a whole bunch of finite element things, right? But, um, but analogly, computing a time integral just basically involves having a capacitor um, accumulate charge on it and then finally measuring the final value of the charge on a capacitor. Um, so in some sense, it involves adjusting the way you think about computation. Uh, and it's it's a little bit harder to pinpoint exactly what the computation is because in some sense, physics is doing it for you. Yeah. Okay, one more question is, what is the equivalent use of thermodynamic hardware to programming with gate or pulse model today? To programming with gates or yeah, because the equivalent in, well, in, in quantum computing and classical is gate, or what happened with the thermodynamic hardware? Um, right, what is the equivalent to, to, to gates? Okay, um, yeah, that's a good question. And um, as I said, in some sense, the thermodynamic hardware is a little bit more like analog computing. And so um, the gate-based model isn't obviously relevant to it. Nevertheless, you do have hyperparameters. And so you have things like, um, that like you have dynamical variables that affect the dynamics of the system. Um, and those would be in some sense analogous to, to gates, or you could, you could view them more like as schedules, right? So to, like you say, what, what kind of schedule would you like for, um, you know, your, your drift function, your diffusion function and your differential equation. And so you can program these schedules and, um, and then it's a little more continuous rather than discrete in terms of gates. Um, yeah, hopefully that is clear. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I wanted to um, end by, this is my final slide. Um, so uh, we've presented a, uh, a sort of new marriage between AI and physics-based hardware. Um, here's the links for the two archive papers that I mentioned. Um, you know, I, as I said, we're a New York-based startup. This is New York in the background here uh, at Central Park. And, um, you know, definitely check out this Thermo Playground. You can use this QR code or the link here, um, and we hope you enjoy it. So thanks very much. I really appreciate all the questions, and thanks again. Thank you so much, Patrick, for all this amazing presentation. It's so completely amazing. The results are completely different than we are expecting. We, when we are talking about quantum computing, but this is interesting and dynamic presentation. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. So I think we don't have any more questions. So I invite you everyone to follow these seminars because this seminar is only for you. So I recommend you subscribe in this channel. And yeah, that don't, don't miss the future seminar, the future talk, because like this is, amazing talks and to make awesome person like Patrick. Mm. So Thanks thank everyone. So okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.